so much. Thank you so much. Excellent. Well, yeah, I decided to change the presentation yesterday. So, all right, that's OK. Uh, very happy to be here, to be back here in Istanbul. Uh, I actually set up a personal record yesterday. Like, you know, when you're reading about coming to Istanbul, they always tell you you have to do this, you have to do this, and you have to go to the airport that takes you like two hours. I got in through security with my luggage till the end in six minutes yesterday. So I found a trick, a loophole, so come to me later, we'll talk. I'm really proud of it. It's my personal record. Uh, but it's not about that today, of course. Now, I do want to talk about responsive design. And I think that this is something that most of you are, well, maybe not struggling, but don't quite know what to do with it. Um, now, my name is Vili, and I'm co-founder of Smash Mac, which is an online magazine for designers and developers. Uh, and most of my time is spent actually editing and writing articles, but approximately 40 to 50% is spent on consulting, kind of working on projects with clients trying to solve responsive design problems. Um, I'm a lazy person, and I like to be able to rely on existing solutions, but I also like to be able to grow on top of existing solutions, which is why the talks I'm trying to give are not about you know, this kind of traditional view of how responsive design looks like. If you ask somebody what responsive design looks like, it's a set of boxes, basically, right? Where you have one design, and one code base that adjusts itself automatically according to you know, whatever screen size you're using. But I think we have to move beyond that because it's not really about boxes. It's way more complicated than that. It's really not about trends, parallax or no parallax, whatever. It doesn't really matter, right? It's also not about frameworks, right? We could use frameworks, we could not use frameworks. It's really not so important. What's more important is, of course, techniques, how can we make the user experience better for our users? Patterns, right? And more specifically, little things like experiments, which I like a lot. So some of the things you're going to see today, you, are not, you will not be able to unsee. I don't take any responsibility for what happens next, right? Uh, but I really want to show them, because I think that this is what we need to be doing more. Now, in order to get there first, we need to see what the design process looks like in general in responsive framework. Now, I think that this quote really hits it on the nail on, the, on its head. The design process is weird and complicated because it involves people and organizations which often are weird and complicated. Uh, I'm not sure about Turkey. Totally true in Germany. Totally true. Um, and if you think about responsive design, I think we should be thinking about creating those really complicated, scalable systems where you have all kinds of different dimensions, ranging from performance, accessibility, navigation, design patterns, touch, and so on and so forth, all the way, right? So every single time we make a design decision or even a development decision, we have to put the right dot in the right place across all of those dimensions to ensure that we create systems that scale up and down. And this is really hard. It's not just adjusting a set of boxes. It's way more complicated than that. And also, we tend to think that we can design these wonderful mockups that we then deliver to, design, uh, to developers who then build the website. The problem is that we have a lot of different states that we have to design. If you look at the user interface stack, right? obviously, we have this ideal state at the bottom, which is what we are designing most of the time. Right? But at the same time, we have to consider the error state, the partial state, the loading state, and the blank state. And it's very interesting because the landscape changes. The blank state doesn't have to be empty anymore. Right? We could be using offline technologies like service workers to make sure that users can access some content even if they're offline. Right? The partial state doesn't have to be broken. We can progressively enhance even if JavaScript isn't loaded yet or isn't loaded properly. Right? We can even style broken images if we wanted to. Right? And the ideal state is not necessarily an ideal state because you know, users might be using browsers that do not support certain features, like Opera Mini doesn't su not supporting web fonts. Right? So this is the ideal state, but I mean, we have to, it's kind of a different, it looks different on different machines. Now, I think that we tend to spend a lot of time thinking about generic solutions for generic problems, right? And we have this kind of understanding that we have to follow the best practices. And I would tell you, to break all the good old practices. Just try something entirely different. Because it's getting old, right? We all heard this. You should not define the line height in pixels. You're not supposed to do that, right? So this is not a good practice. Or you should not base the breakpoints on device sizes. You should not do that. This is not a good practice. Or you should not take the name of the Lord performance in vain, right? Things like that. It's all over the place, and everybody's talking about best practices, and everything is everybody's talking about what you should do, what you should not do. 
So try next time to do things that you're not supposed to do and see what happens next. Because every single time I run into a problem when I have to design something, this is how it goes. You want to build something and you think, oh, maybe it's nice to have a navigation and you, know, you have a, uh, you, know, you start with desktop and you look into what, what's going to work and what's going, not going to work. And at some point you realize this is where audio should kick in, right? That you should not start designing with desktop. You should start designing with mobile, right? All right, so then you actually go ahead and design mobile, and then you know how it works. You have a little screen. Then you put your whatever. You have to put your navigation in, so you put your hamburger icon in. But then you realize you should not be using the hamburger icon because it's not cool anymore. So what are you going to do now? All right, so I'm going to display all the navigation items because I can't hide them behind the navigation bar or hamburger icon. So in the end, you end up with a really kind of narrow different side, and then you actually want to plug in all the content, right? And then you realize, well, it's kind of difficult because, you know, I, I, will, be able, I will have to put all of this content, and the most important thing, or some important things, are going to be at the bottom. So <laughs> I cannot use, you know, put icon below the fold, so I should change it now, all right? So you know where it's going. <laughs> Right? So I have to plug it in somehow, so one of the good, better patterns is to use a carousel. And the carousel, of course, doesn't have a good reputation, I think. Right? So in the end, you end up doing this. This is your design process. Right? This is your design workflow, which doesn't really feel right. Um, I hope that the screen is going to work soon. Um, but it doesn't mean that we should be doing something entirely different. Oh, all right, no slides. All right, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be doing anything like that we should not be following the, the best practices. Maybe we should, but it's a really good idea to actually keep breaking it as well. So the examples that you can't see actually show a few <laughs> uh, ideas of what you could do to potentially break it. Um, okay, I can tell you about the, uh, the airport story now, I think. No? All right. So the best bit is, so here's how it goes. Actually, we can talk a lot about airport tricks. I Oh, damn it. All right, so find me later during the, after, during the break. So it doesn't mean that we should be breaking the web doing things like this. This is one of the recent websites, which was released for the Blomberg Business Week Design 2016 for April. And it's different, right? From the user experience perspective, it's maybe not the most user-friendly website ever, right? But it's definitely different. <laughs> Right? It's definitely different. It has a special voice. It has a special tone. It's highly recognizable. You will never be able to forget this website. Right? And this is what I tend to miss a lot today, where many things are becoming generic. You know, the perfect website, you just build, you know, you put a header on the top with a big headline with a small subline underneath, image, text, text, image, text, image, carousel carousel and then the footer, and this is your website, right? Maybe we could be experimenting and doing things like that. And it doesn't have to be as crazy as you know, this one. I think the point was here to really exaggerate. But maybe something a bit more subtle like this, where the idea is to use this kind of zoomable interfaces, where normally we're just moving from links to links, right? Kind of navigating from one page to another to the next. But what we're doing here, right? is actually a bit more than that. You know this metaphor when you're actually opening the door and you enter a room, and if you want to go back, you have to open the door again and go back. So this is kind of the same metaphor used in different scenario. So instead of actually going from one page to another, using breadcrumbs for navigation, for example, right? we just enter a door, and then you have to go back in order to move, go to another door. right? So why don't we play with something like that instead, instead of actually just having breadcrumbs or links? The same used in slightly different scenario, again, where you have kind of a dashboard, so to say, and then you keep clicking and you go in one section, then you, and then you zoom in, and then basically you zoom out. And of course, it all can be re entirely responsive, so you know, this is going to work everywhere. Going in and then going back using not just you know, clicking on a link somewhere, but actually escaping and then going back, right? Uh, I also like these little examples. Uh, if you look at the sites like TED.com, right, you might say, well, this is a regular normal design, but I actually really pay attention to these little things. As, as you scroll down, when you actually start playing a movie, they actually show the preview of the movie in the left upper corner. So even if you're following a transcript, for example, or if you're just reading the article, they still will be playing the movie, so, uh, the, well, the talk, so you can actually follow both, which I think is really, really nice. 
So if you start playing and you scroll down, come on. Oh, keep going, right? So the video is actually playing in the left upper corner with a transcript actually showing, highlighting where you currently are. I think this is a little thing that actually is really, really useful. Right? Uh, and even if it's really just a little thing, visual thing, that gives you a sense of perspective, I think it's really important to have something like a hook, right? So every website should have something like a hook, something that is really different in terms of style. So the only thing that is different at this side, maybe, actually except from the re regular Swiss greed and everything, is that they're using these boxes for call to actions, right? You see the subscribe box? It always has this height, and it's always, you know, the text is always in, at the bottom, and it's always consistently repeating in the interface. This has kind of become the visual language in a way, which I think is really, really interesting. Uh, and everything else is kind of, you know, regular thing. There's nothing too special about it. But this little thing is kind of repeating everywhere, and this has become the signature, which I think is important. Again, something like a hook. Or even if it's the light like this one, right? You start typing in your email address. At some point, when you're typing the password, nobody wants to pick in. So, you know, it's going to be protected. It's going to be secure. So don't worry about that. Even things like that, right? It's different. It's a signature, again, something that people will remember. Or even things like that, again, a little thing, where instead of showing your picture, we just break it in parts and do something crazy with it, like more or less random experiment. So every time you refresh the page, the position is going to be different, the color is going to be different, and it actually goes for every single page, all the project pages, all the about pages, and so on. Again, a little hook, right, that makes up the experience a little bit more different than the regular websites are. And this one has probably the biggest newsletter box I've ever seen in my life. Uh, if you scroll down, please. You don't have to search. Just scroll down already. Right? So if you scroll down, I mean, you see the overview of articles, nothing too fancy about it. But at some point, at some point, you actually see a big, huge newsletter box kicking in. And now, and I don't mind, it looks great if you ask me, right? And it's, again, it's a little bit different because most of the boxes are very small and very tiny. So what I did want to show you today uh, are some of the interesting patterns that we should be keeping in mind. Now, I showed some of them, but I want to show a bit more in terms of navigation because I think that navigation is something that we all have to use. And we will discover more in my workshop if you happen to come to my workshop uh, on Friday, I think. So this is everywhere. The Hamburg icon is everywhere, right? Everybody's using it. You can find it all over the place. Now, the problem is, should we be using it or should we not be using it? Because some people, you know, some tests show that they're not as recognizable, as widely accepted menu buttons. Well, it doesn't matter if you ask me. Use the menu button. Use the Hamburg icon. If your audience knows what it is, that's what matters most. However, when you use it, be it a menu button or a Hamburg icon, make sure that you actually pay attention to how you use it. Because the way you implement it is really, really important. So here, can you spot any problem? I can go back. Can you spot any problem with the hamburger icon or the navigation interaction pattern here on sours.com? Now, one problem that we encounter a lot is people have two scenarios when they actually try to visit the site or browse the site. First, they click on that icon, and then they actually see the options that they, you know, where the sections where they can look at and then navigate. But then at the same time, and then they actually click and then they navigate, right? But at the same time, because you don't see any navigation at all when you access the site, people tend to click on the, cl on the button, see all the options, and they want to close this drawer again right away. And if you have to move your mouse or move your finger to close it, it's a little bit more uncomfortable. So one way to fix it is, I feel a little stupid saying that, is to make sure that whenever you open it, make sure that you have the close link or close button or close icon, whatever, right there. So users don't have to move their mouse or move their finger. Right? Um, however, you have to be really careful with the hamburger icon. So this is a nice study by time.com where they actually introduced, had introduced the hamburger icon, uh, I think, two years ago. And they realized that the traffic dropped, right? Now, normally, you don't want that, right? So they thought, well, probably people don't know what the icon means. So let's add the menu as text to explain what it is. Well, they added it, and the traffic didn't change. They thought, well, that 
weird. People just don't understand what's going on here. Let's explain it properly. So the edit and overlay explaining what this icon means, right? Um, and yeah, guess what? Traffic increased for the first, first few weeks, and then it dropped again, right? Not the only time it happened. The same thing happened to NBC News. They introduced the hamburger icon, traffic dropped. They thought, let's make it obvious, right? Simple navigation with the new hamburger icon, why not? Let's drag, bring it on. Problem is, traffic still dropped. It didn't help. So I thought, let's make it yellow. Just, you know, because we can, right? Uh, the traffic did not increase. So well, this was the end result, right? And you might ask yourself, so how does it work on mobile? Well, they're showing as many items as they can at any given point. And if they can't show something, they just hide it behind the more area, like the priority plus pattern, as it's called, right? So you show as much as you can, and if you can't show it, you hide it. Because you always have this uncomfortable range where you could be displaying something, but you don't display anything because you can't display everything, I think, right? And why? Because you could show everything, something at, at any given point. Because if you hide something behind an icon, behind the menu, behind the button, the traffic will drop. If it's not visible, if it's not obvious, people will not click on it, right? Even if it just takes a little bit more effort to actually click through. So if you have important actions to show, never hide them. Just display them right away, right? Uh, this is also the pattern that The Guardian is using with the all button in the right. Uh, and it's also important to keep in mind how we're using mobile devices, right? So if you think about it, the most convenient um, input device is our finger or our thumb, to be precise. This is what most people are using when they're interacting with a mobile device. So if you have a mobile phone, it's very rare that you will be using uh, orientation, like the landscape orientation when reading an article. It's, this is the posture. This is how you're actually accessing the site, or actually like this. But it doesn't matter. Right? Uh, so. That's important because it actually really changes the way we should be interacting with the websites, right? In 75% of the cases, thumb is the most important factor that drives interaction on the site, on the mobile view, which means that some areas are more and some others are less easy to design for, to use. Which means that, for example, the bottom left area, bottom right area, top left area, top right area are dead. They're really difficult to touch. Well, to navigate, to access, right? If you have a tall enough device, you, you need to be a superhuman in order to access the left, left upper hamburger icon, which is where it's usually found, right? So some areas are easier to design for. Like if you look at the green one, green area, this is where maybe the most accessible feature should be. However, you should not think that you should be putting the most important things, like the delete button, in this green area. Because you don't want people to click on it accidentally all the time. You don't want it to be too easy to use, right? So you probably want to put the delete button maybe in here, or maybe somewhere in the yellow area, but not in the green area. But the most important things, like the, if the navigation is being used a lot, then it probably should be in the green area. Again, not bottom left, not bottom right, not top left, not top right, which really changes the way we interact with the you know, mobile devices. Uh, tablets, the other thing, right? As it turns out, we're using tablets differently. So it's not like we're running with a tablet like this all the time, just looking at the tablet. It's like we're using tablets when we're lying in bed. And when we lie in bed, we have a significant problem, which is our belly. So we have this real weird phenomenon that we cannot, uh, we cannot easily access buttons at the bottom of the tablet right here, right? Just because it's, we have our bellies that you know, cover it. So which is why the better areas to design for are on the left and on the right on tablets, right? And also, the taller the device becomes, the smaller this little blurb becomes where you can easily you know, uh, access content, which is really interesting and really important. So what does it mean for us as designers? Well, this is the state of the art today, kind of repeating what I said. Ported orientation, one-handed grip, tall screens, high-resolution screens. Most websites, well, not most, 20% uh, websites are responsive, and bottom controls are kind of easier to reach. But it means that we should be redesigning our interfaces altogether, kind of trying to move the most important things instead of the off-canvas pattern, instead of the hamburger icon, to the bottom of the screen. Now, this is what's been done, uh, what's been done on Facebook, uh, on iOS, where they kind of moving, moved away from this off-canvas pattern on the left, with the most important things displayed at the bottom. 
But it's not just Facebook doing that. Here's another case study from Spotify, where they show an increase in menu item use and increase in auctions overall when they put the items again away from the hamburger icon in the top left corner to the bottom. And it goes, keeps going and going and going. Pitchfork is also a very nice example for that. So they have a regular navigation normally on the top. And then in smaller screens, they're kind of dropping to this bottom bar, which you will see more and more happening today, right? which is really, really interesting. Uh, the same happens, for like, example, in uh, news websites. Right? Again, all of a sudden, everybody decided to put the icons at the bottom, well, just because they're easier to use this way. Right? Uh, and we also saw just right now, Mustafa showed an example of a website where they actually also had the Hamburg icon not on the top left corner, but rather in the bottom left corner, kind of floating with you as you scroll the site. Because this is actually much easier to access. And it happens like everywhere all the time. You'll find things like, I'm almost finished, don't worry. Um, they'll find things like breadcrumbs at the bottom, right? Or filters at the bottom. Or uh, add to cart item, always at the bottom, right? Because obviously the thumb is right there. It's much easier to, to you know, click on add to cart if it's at the bottom than if it's on the top. So it's kind of sticking to the bottom. So whenever you want to add an item to the cart, you can do it right away, right? Or even things like move to the next step uh, and go to the shopping cart at the bottom as well, right? Uh, which, you know, it's interesting. Um, and sometimes you'll find people actually going further because you can actually turn away from the traditional navigation that you have on the left, right, into a floating navigation, like a curtain navigation, as it's called. And you could be dropping it to the bottom of the page as well, right? Um, so there are many options that you could potentially use. And if it's a complex navigation like this one, right, which is, I guess, the most usual use case for most websites at all, where you have some primary navigation and you have a sub-navigation, but both are kind of important. So in that case, you can actually just you know, choose to play with space. For example, here, you could provide both. right? We can just use, make use of that, because normally it's not what happens. Normally you have a big list with a you know, huge list of accordions, which is just not necessary. Right? This is also what Financial Times is doing, where instead of just stacking things, well, globally in large view, they're actually showing everything, but then they're kind of categorizing a little bit, right? kind of trying to deal with mega dropdowns. This is a very nice way of how to deal with complex navigation menus like mega dropdowns. Right? Very similar to the previous one have to skip this one, right? And we have something really complicated. Think about dual views, like split-screen views, where you could have a filters on navigation on the left, kind of floating or being fixed, depending on what you want to do, right? So as you're navigating through the, well, navigation of the filters, the defining filters, the content is being displayed on the right side at the same time, right? Normally, it's not like that at all. If you go and try to go through different retail, uh, e-commerce e retail stores, you'll find it's really troublesome to go and adjust all the filters and then go and readjust all the filters and then add more filters and so on. So here, what you can do is actually showing both, both the filters and the content at the same time. So whenever you readjust the filters, you can actually really go ahead and see the content, even on a small screen. And this is what we've been trying to do. And this is kind of crazy. Uh, because I'm really, I'm not a pixel perfectionist, right? But I really care about every single pixel. I really care about every single pixel. So I thought, why is it that we have so many navigation menus occupying so much space? Because most users don't really need navigation, they just want to read an article, right? They want to be able to access the navigation, but it's not like they need the navigation all the time. So I was thinking, and we're playing and playing, and I realized that actually the main problem is that in many scenarios, the logo occupies a lot of space. So I asked myself, so what if I run some tests and, re and just check if logo is important or not? And this is what we decided to do in the end. We just removed the logo. It might sound scary to some of you. I mean, you know, you go to the client, and the client tells you, just you know, do whatever you want to do. Just don't touch the logo, right? And I said, why not touching? I like touching things. Well, not this way, but I mean, I like touching things. Why not, right? So we thought. If people are reading an article on Smash Magazine, they probably know that they're reading an article on Smash Magazine. So why do you need a logo then? Why don't you not display the logo only on the front page? So people who are not familiar with the site you know, might see the logo. But you don't have to show it. And I was surprised, remarkably surprised, how well it worked in usability studies. People loved it. And you know what people loved most? 
the emoji icons. <laughs> you know, I'm, not, I'm not the guy who just you know, goes and selects the right icon, just the perfect icon for the job. I was boring. Uh, I was bored and lazy, and I thought, I don't have to, you know, I'm not going to search for an icon. I'm just going to pick one that I feel is right and, you know, whatever. So for the membership, we selected the circus emoji icon. People loved it. It has nothing to do with membership, but I don't care. That's okay. People like it. They click all the time. It's crazy. I don't even know why. People also like the trending icon. They click on it all the time just because it's emoji icon, I guess. I don't know. Do you like emoji? Who likes emoji? Okay, when it's weird. Oh, I don't know. So, you know, oh, it doesn't matter. So, but in the end, I was able to save a lot of space for navigation, uh, which I think is pretty cool. So you can really reinvent the navigation. And of course, I mean, you have to make sure that uh, the most important things are not at the right at the top or not right at the bottom, which is why it's kind of a little bit offset on the top. But we'll see how it's going. All right. Uh, okay, just to summarize, um, we should never hide important actions. We should define priorities for navigation items, kind of try to show as much as we can when we can. Thumbs are important. We should be considering curtain navigation, like showing both like dual panes, if you like. Um, we can use tabs at the bottom as filters and also combine filters and navigation in one, just so users can both access the filters and see the content. Um, we can also consider using filters in general instead of sections, right? Normally, when you could just uh, you know, set up your filters and then navigation will be displayed depending on what your filters are. And the only thing that I can you know, leave you with, and it's almost like a magic trick, just better, accordions work everywhere. Accordions are great. Accordions are better than anything in the world. It's like Flexbox for, for people who code and accordions for UX people. They just work everywhere. It's like I've never seen any use case where accordions failed miserably. So, Use accordions everywhere. All right. With that in mind, uh, OK, this is not supposed to be happening, but <laughs> this is mine. Thank you, and stay responsive at home, I guess. Thank you for being here. All right. Do uh, we have any questions? Do we take questions? I like questions. Yes. Greg. Yes. Um, don't, uh, we don't take questions from you. Okay, next person then. <laughs> right. Um, how do you balance discoverability of a hamburger menu on the top left where it's really visible versus on the bottom where it may not be visible but maybe touchable? Right. So the question is how do you how do you find this balance between making sure that the icon is visible and so it's, if it's on the top left corner, it's a kind of visible, but then it's better kind of touchable at the bottom. Well, I think that you can actually still make it visible at the bottom as well. So one of the ideas that I actually saw from Adrian, of all people sitting right here, uh, was that one of the newspapers was using this really nice pattern where they had a um, hamburger icon at the bottom right, and it was floating. And the further you float down, the more transparent it becomes. right? So it's kind of still present. It's still there. It's just not annoying. Um, so you can actually still use it in a way. Um, Personally, I feel like if you want to show, it doesn't matter what you're using, if it's the hamburger icon or the menu bar button or whatever, you just have to make sure that it's kind of visible. Of course, if it's at the bottom, it's kind of disrupting in a way because people just want to read. But you could use this technique in order to keep it there but not being you know, too present, kind of being subtle, I think. Nobody asks about the airport or oh, whatever. That's okay. Anything else? All right, that's fine, cool, thank you.